There was a survey done recently by the real estate company Zillow in which they discovered that the people who responded were able on average to answer two of five questions correctly about important matters in their own personal finances. But they were able to answer on average three questions correctly about the personal lives of celebrities. I read somewhere recently, I, I try not to keep up with certain politicians, but nonetheless, uh, somewhere I read that Donald Trump had said he is more popular than Taylor Swift. I'm not entirely sure what that says about either of them. I suspect it's not entirely complimentary to either, but so be it. Uh, it says something about what we imagine the role of politics is and the role of, of being a public figure is. Apparently, it's simply to be more popular than other people. I, I couldn't answer that. This isn't exactly a new thing. You may remember that in 1966, John Lennon gave an interview in which he described the Beatles as more popular than Jesus. It was a quite controversial thing at the time. I suppose it still would be today in some quarters, but uh, certainly at the time, nobody would imagine anyone speaking in that way. Down to the present time, certainly we have changed our attitude somewhat. Now we are famous for making up people who are famous for simply being famous. I'm not sure what that says about them or us. I suspect it is worth our time to stop and think a little about whether that is wise and the ways that it cheapens both them and us. If someone is famous for nothing in particular, what do we even know about that person and what may be the light of God that shines in that person? What does it say about us that we don't care about finding the light in that person but simply want to love to hate that person for what he or she wears or where he or she goes or says or, or whatever else he or she may do? This gospel lesson that we heard read just now is the same one that was read on the fifth Sunday of Lent. And on that occasion, I preached at some length about the way that in the Gospel of John, the cross and the events of Holy Week are a revealing in a negative sense of the systems of this world, an exposing, an expose of the ways that the ways of this world, the systems of this world enslave us and kill us in one way or another. I want to suggest to you that the little story we hear once again tonight says something to us about the system of fame and acclaim and popularity. I don't want to make too much of the poor Greeks. I'm sure that they had good reasons, for religious reasons, for coming to Jerusalem for the festival, but I also think it's probably realistic to imagine they were just a little starstruck by Jesus and that they were coming to see him in part simply because he was famous rather than for anything they expected to get from him in terms of wisdom. And this may help us a little bit to understand his response, which sounds just a little bit cranky. Who are these people and what is it that they want aside from worldly fame? I think what happens in this story and certainly what happens for the rest of Holy Week makes very clear to us how little value human acclaim plays in God's valuing of the world and of us. It certainly cannot grant us salvation to be famous. It cannot ennoble us to be famous. All we have to do is look at the famous people we can think of. It can't grant us any sort of immortality. If I routed off the names David Garrick, Sarah Siddons, and John Philip Kemble, would you know who any of those people are? Well, they were the rock star theater performers of the 18th century in English language theater, and nobody has any idea who they are now. They're gone, forgotten. Our fame falls to the ground with us. It is only in the esteem of God that we find our true value. It is only in following the example of humility that Jesus sets in being willing even to become notorious, to be ashamed for the sake of God, that we find the way of Christ in our own lives. It's a hard message because we like to be popular. We like to be successful. We want to feel like other people admire us for who we are and what we do. 
But if we read anything in the story of Good Friday, it is that God will find the value in us regardless of what anyone else may see. And indeed, we'll find value in things that others would gladly discard. That is worth thinking about as we go through our own lives and decide what part of ourselves is truly valuable to God. Perhaps the, the, the happy side of this story is to imagine that perhaps God is finding value right now in us in the things that we don't. Even where we find our own weakness, even where we find our own brokenness, even when we find our own incompetence, God is finding a way to transform those things for the glory of God's kingdom. So, again, spare a, a kind thought for the Greeks as we also look for just a little bit of rubbing up against the star power of Jesus. But always remember where that leads. Ultimately to the glory of God, but through a great deal of pain. Let each one of us not disdain to do that as well in the hope of attaining the glory that God desires for each one of us. Amen.